Caroline Hyde from London in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the Silicon Valley view on the June jobs report and the outlook for tech workers with the increasing threat of automation. Plus, a Bloomberg scoop. Investigators say Russian hackers are chief suspects in a breach of US power plants. We'll look into how they may have pulled off the cyber attacks and their potential end game. And Samsung reports a second quarter for the ages. But can it maintain momentum as its heir apparent continues his own courtroom battle? We'll discuss. First to our lead, the U.S. jobs report for June shows payrolls coming in strong. 222,000 positions added. That beat forecast. But wage growth weaker than expected. Check out this chart in the Bloomberg. You can type in G hashtag BTV1764 if you're a user and you want to see it for yourself. In the white line, how we're seeing U.S. average hourly earnings change year on year. June, we're up 2.5%. But month on month, that's just 0.2% increase. We are seeing a lack of wage growth, lack, therefore, potentially of inflationary pressure. Are workers there for still underemployed? Is this slack in the system? Or perhaps automation and the rise of technology is allowing employers to hold down wages for longer? Here to discuss the June jobs report and future disruptions in the labour market, we're joined by Andrew Chamberlain, chief economist at Glassdoor, which operates a massive jobs and company database. And with us for the hour, it's our guest host, you know him well, David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. And let's get straight to you, Adam, because I'm focusing on the silver lining here. I'm focusing in on the numbers. They're looking healthy more people joining the labor force but when we look at Bloomberg's own analysis it looks like department stores landline telecoms these are the biggest job losses out there we are seeing disruption affecting jobs at the moment aren't we Yes, absolutely. We are seeing some evidence of automation in certain sectors. We all know that blue collar roles like people at the ports, people that work in warehouse, drivers, they're clearly going to be affected. What many people are not talking about is that white collar jobs will be affected also. So for example, uh, loan officers, and um, uh, other white collar roles that are increasingly being replaced by apps and software, they are at risk as well. And we do see some evidence of this uh, in Glassdoor's uh, salary data today. AI becoming more prevalent, more re re relevant. And David, is the U.S. ready for this? Well, I don't think the U.S. is ready for it. And I think b before I make another comment, I want to say we absolutely need to have policy and investment to accommodate the reality that job dislocation is going to become pervasive across the economy, including in white collar professions, as Andrew points out. But there's an irony about all the hand wringing in Silicon Valley about job losses because of automation, given that we are at you know, closer to full employment than we've been in a long time. The Fed this week yeah. was talking about being worried we have too much unemployment. We, we don't have enough unemployment. So the times, I mean, the time to be having this sort of concern is is perhaps a slightly odd one. But odd. nevertheless, we, we look forward and we look to this odd conundrum. And I want to get, Adam, your take on the fact that, yes, we are seeing, as, as David pointed out, sort of near record amounts of, of employment at the moment. However, we're not seeing any sort of wage pressure building into the system. Can you talk to us about the underlying reasons for this? Because perhaps it's not quite automation feeding into this yet. No, not necessarily. So underneath the top line wage figure, that 2.5% wage growth, there's a lot of diversity. And so I think that it's quite misleading to just focus on the top line figure. Today, it depends on what city you're in and what job you're doing. And that is what determines your wage growth. So certain roles in healthcare and software, they're seeing wages rise at 3, 4, 5% per year. And then there are uh, other roles, such as uh, manufacturing design engineers, where you're seeing wages fall year over year. So I think the excessive focus on the top line figure does miss the fact that there are labor shortages they're just happening in cities like San Francisco New York and Seattle and not in cities like uh, Atlanta and Houston today so Andrew how therefore do we read into this on a more general basis? how can policy help ease this is it by helping people move from state to state to make people labor mobility more easy uh, certainly labor mobility will absolutely help uh, part of the 
problem today is we have close to six million job openings in the United States, and the problem is many people who need jobs are not in the same cities that are creating jobs. And so um, anything with anything from housing policy to uh, uh, tax policy, anything that encourages people to relocate to where there is work absolutely will help. Um, there's also this issue of uh, training and just making sure people have the right skills, making sure universities are teaching what employers need to hire today. I don't think that's happening, and I think that's why you're seeing the rise of things like coding boot camps to fill in the gaps. So, David, we heard from Andrew that perhaps we're seeing coding boot camps and the like. We, Silicon Valley, if you say, if you may, stepping up and helping retrain. Talk to us about the hand wringing that you talked about and the fact that many are already talking of perhaps, well, taxing robots in the future. What, you know, what are you an overall optimist or pessimist when it comes to automation and the effect this has on the economy and on people? Well, my, myself, I am an optimist, but that's, I'm sort of an optimist about everything. Maybe you can discount me <laughs> for that reason. But, you know, and certainly in Silicon Valley, and I think you could give them credit for recognizing that the profound innovations that they are uh, bequeathing to the world, and you mentioned AI earlier, that being one of them, is clearly changing the job landscape dramatically and will continue to do so. They have stepped up, and many, many people, leaders in tech, are really actively and publicly worried about that. Um, and we, there's no question we need to train people, we need to do a better job of connecting companies to the availability of workers. But it is weird that people don't want to move. Uh, there was a study just this week I saw that young people are spending so much time on video games, they don't want to, young men, that that's one of the reasons that they're not working as much. They love just hanging out playing video games. It's astonishing some of the things that are happening that are throwing off the traditional calculations. Wow. I mean, Andrew, you're a man who's all about calculations. Talk to us, therefore, of July numbers, the rest of 2017. Where do we see this pattern of employment, of wage growth going? Do you think we remain at this stagnant wage growth level? Well, today marks the eight-year anniversary of this economic expansion, and we don't see any end in sight. Uh, it's hard to believe that we can continue to have such sluggish wage growth with close to six million job openings and such robust hiring. So I am an optimist as well about automation, as, as David mentioned. Uh, in the long run, the his history and the evidence are completely clear. Automation always ends up creating more jobs than it destroys and it raises wages in the long run. So I think people should be optimistic about growing automation. They should be happy that it allows us to produce more per hour of work. And when we'll know automation is really affecting the labor market is when we see the productivity numbers rise. Today we don't see that. We see slow productivity. And if automation were really happening, for every hour a person works, you would see them producing much more output. So I'm a data person. I'm going to wait for the evidence on automation and uh, um, maybe uh, dial back fears until we see something in the data. We love some data people. We want you on again. Andrew Chamberlain, thank you very much indeed. Chief Economist at Glassdoor, wonderful to have your opinion today. And David Kirkpatrick with Techonomy, he's sticking with us. Now a story we're watching in the world of autos. Elon Musk's Tesla has won a contract to supply what he calls the world's largest lithium battery. It will be used to back up South Australia's power grid, which has been plagued by blackouts. The electric car maker promises to provide 100 megawatts of storage by December the 1st. Now, coming up, as Putin and Trump agreed to jointly examine cybersecurity issues at the G20, we'll dive into a Bloomberg scoop. Russian hackers are chief suspects in a breach of at least a dozen U.S. power plants, including a nuclear one in Kansas. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, 11 p.m. right here in London, 10 p.m. even. This is Bloomberg. Now, Chinese smartphone maker Xiaomi has turned a corner in sales. The company reported second quarter shipments rose 70% to more than 23 million devices. And it's now targeting shipments of 100 million units in 2018. The smartphone maker, which slipped to the fifth spot in the market cap globally in the first quarter, is trying to regain the dizzying growth that once made it one of China's most successful startups. 
Meanwhile, Bloomberg has learned that Russians may be behind cyber attacks at a dozen or more U.S. power plants. The attackers may be positioning themselves to eventually disrupt supply, though there's no threat to public safety yet. This as Putin and Trump agreed to jointly examine cybersecurity issues and how to determine accountability for future hacking. That was at a meeting at the G20 in Germany. Now, Mike Riley covers cybersecurity for Bloomberg News and wrote this great story. And joining us from Washington now, still with us, of course, David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy. And Mike, talk us through it. We've got Putin and, and Trump speaking, looking to build bridges. Meanwhile, we get evidence that hackers of a foreign government, and it seems a Russian government here, are looking to potentially infiltrate the infrastructure of the U.S. How do we know that they're Russian? You know, I think that's right. It's like, I think one of the things that's going on is that, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the confluence of the meeting and the news breaking about these hacks on power plants shows that there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, even as the two leaders are, are, are meeting. I think that in terms of the Russian, like how you determine uh, that th these are Russian hackers, you have both private security company, companies who are in the plants themselves doing this, but also the FBI and the NSA are involved in the, the attribution. Everyone that, that we, we talked to, which was multiple sources, said that all fingers seem to be pointed at this point to, to, to Russia. I think part of the context of this is, um, and why the U.S. government is so worried, is that in the last two years, the Russian hackers took down the Ukrainian power grid uh, two different times, and they keep getting more sophisticated, as if as if they're using the the, U, the Ukraine as kind of a test bed for this kind of stuff. So when suddenly you uh, hackers that that seem to be connected to Russia start hitting uh, a dozen power plants in the U.S., including nuclear power plants, it makes them very very nervous. I mean, fascinating, really. I want to get David's opinion of you know. It seems to be not a matter of if, but when. How concerned as a member of the U.S. population are you? You mean when we start losing power because the Russians are not turning it off? I, I hope that's not true. I, and I think actually, you know, as Mike pointed out, you know, cyber forensics are actually much better than a lot of people realize. And while hacking is a real problem, the detection is improving in its as a science as well. But but I think it's another thing I frankly slightly disagree with Mike about is the idea that the U.S. government is really worried because if we were, then I think our president would be making this a bigger concern. I don't really think President Trump is worried worried about this, even though you could make the case that the Russian government is, in effect, waging a kind of war on our economy. And if, you know, we really are so worried that power plants might start going out because of their behavior, we should be taking action, you know, at least in terms of our jawboning and, and public statements and treating the way this is seriously at the U.N. and elsewhere uh, much differently than we are. I don't hear that kind of talk coming from Washington. Mike, is there talk coming from Washington? And, and also, can you paint for us really some of the background here? Because you did some great investigative journalism into what went on, particularly at Wolf Creek nuclear site. Um, so the first point, I think it's, it's we are in a relatively unique position in that, that uh, people in the national security, uh, part of the government, people in the, uh, that have to think about the power grid are pretty worried about this. But <clears throat> By all accounts, President Trump um, doesn't particularly think that the Russians try to influence the election. And as a result, I think that that means that the way that he views any of these claims uh, are going to be clouded by, um, by his sense of what hackers, and especially Russian hackers, did or didn't do during the election. It's really kind of a unique position for the government to be in, and it does create this, this kind of split um, personality um, within different parts of the government. In terms of what the, the hackers actually did, the U.S. government did send out, and they do this in, in, in relatively rarely, but in, in situations where, like this, they sent out a, a warning to utilities and stakeholders with a lot of information about how they could detect these same hackers in their, um, in their uh, systems. And one of the things that, the, the, that was clear is you could see that the, the, they, the malware that the hackers were using, they get in through the enterprise, which is basically just the office computers, but they seem to be scanning internal parts of the network looking for connections between those computers and control systems. It's the control systems, of course, that would control things like turbines and other things. Now, as far as we know, they, they hadn't been successful in doing that. And in fact, the concern that the government put out was persistence. In other words, they're worried that these guys are going to burrow into these networks, which might give them the ability to, to pull the trigger on something more uh, serious at the time of their choosing. Fascinating amount of depth that you managed to get into. And, and David, therefore, when you're looking at not only this revelation coming from Mike's reporting, but also the not one but two significant global cyber attacks that we've seen in the last couple of months, is are companies getting this? 
is investment going into cybersecurity speedily enough and our governments reacting quickly enough? Well, I do think there has been a major shift in the way big companies think about the risks of cybersecurity in just the last two or three years. And at the board level, most companies are now talking about this and CEOs are on alert. This is a big deal. Money is being spent. But I That's think, fun. you know, we also have a challenge. Again, it's a public policy and strategy point, but I think we need a global treaty on this. We need global discussions among nations oh, yeah. to discuss what is proper, what is not proper. And the fact that that's not happening or not even being discussed as urgent worries me. Plenty to mull still over the weekend. Techonomy's David Kirkpatrick. You're sticking with me. Bloomberg's Mike Riley. Great piece. I urge our viewers to go on to Bloomberg.com and read it. Thank you very much indeed. Now coming up, U.S. stocks rebounded from the biggest sell-off since May, closing out the week with gains. Will there continue to whipsaw trading for big cap tech stocks, though? We explain. And a feature that I'd like to bring to your attention is our new interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. And you can send our producers a message. Play along with the charts we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only, though, I'm afraid. Check it out. It's TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Now, a new note from J.P. Morgan analyst Doug Anmuth says Twitter continues to make positive product changes. That includes the new user interface updates rolled out in June. He also expects greater relevance and more engagement to ultimately translate into ad revenue growth. However, J.P. Morgan still have a neutral rating on the stock. Meanwhile, tech stocks ended the week on a higher note in the United States. The Nasdaq rose more than a percent in Friday's session, recovering a bit from losses suffered last week. Here for more reaction, let's bring in Bloomberg News stocks reporter Abigail Doolittle. Still with us, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. Abigail, take us through the U.S. moves, first of all. Well, it was a pretty impressive session, uh, Caroline. We saw a really nice rally for all three major averages, but really that Nasdaq, that tech-heavy Nasdaq that you mentioned stood out, up more than 1%, really being led by lots of the big tech names the FANG names, plus Apple, all of these stocks had big, big gains on the day and didn't appear to be driven by anything fundamental outside of a boost in confidence and optimism, probably on that better than expected jobs report. So we had some bullish action there. And we hop into the Bloomberg and take a look at the GRR, Group Rank Function Return on the S&P 500. We see tech up there on top, up 17%. And they, actually, excuse me, that is the year to date, but that's the story. We have tech up in a big way on the year and we have it look at this on the day up in a big way too up one and a quarter percent so really a very solid day for technology but let's put this in the context of the pullback we still have the nasdaq down about three percent from its last all-time high on june 9th lots of whipsaws you know you would think that today was the best day in quite some time but it's actually just the best day since last wednesday all of this volatility investors mm -hmm. not quite sure whether or not they want to be buying the dip or if they are still a little bit cautious time will tell we do have earnings season ahead of course we certainly do. If you're looking across at some of the other regions, Europe, we saw technology, the number two in terms of industry groups in Europe here on the stock 600 for the day. And indeed, it was up on the week. Interestingly, Asia was down for our information technology stocks throughout the day and indeed the week. But let's turn to David's viewpoint here because Abigail mentioned fangs. Um, is it time to be, well, if we amid this dip, we see a little bit of buying. Are you a buyer when we see these sorts of dips happen well, and, and volatility? Well, keep in mind, my company is called Techonomy. So I'm a big mm. believer that this is the way the entire economy is moving. I don't think it's at all inappropriate to continue to believe in the critical importance and future op opportunities for this group of companies. So yes, I mean, in general, I would buy on the dips, especially for the great companies that aren't going anywhere and that show every sign of consolidating more and more profit to them and perhaps at the cost of the rest of the economy but yeah techonomy technology uh, techonomy my favorite word <laughs> technology is the future of the US and global economy it's as simple as that meanwhile Abigail you kept a close eye on the volatility that we're seeing and and talk us through how it is across the board generally in sentiment at the moment well, it's pretty fantastic what's happening relative to volatility, especially volatility for tech. So not so long ago, Kevin Kelly of Recon Capital, he joined us on Options Insight, and he was making a big deal of the spread between the S&P 500 VIX and the VIX uh, on the NASDAQ 100 or the VXN. In fact, if we pop back into the Bloomberg and take a look at G hashtag BTV 96, there.
bear in blue. We have that S&P 500 VIX down at 11 near all time uh, lows. And back in March, Kevin Kelly was making a big deal of the fact that the S&P 500 uh, VIX had dropped below the tech VIX. That, that was really uh, sort of, uh, or the tech VIX, excuse me, in orange had dropped below the S&P 500 VIX, kind of unusual. But now we have this big blowout and volatility for tech stocks. So the sector, it is still the best sector on the year, but it has given back some of the gains. So the best sector on the year now seeing the biggest volatility. He thinks that this VXN up near 17 could be a tell on overall volatility for the markets ahead, perhaps uh, led by earnings season and what may be to come. But certainly something to keep an eye on there, more of the whipsaws that we've been experiencing for the stock market. And talking of volatility, I mean, just everyone needs to eye up the $8 billion that was wiped off of the market cap of Tesla just this week alone. Great insight. Abigail Doolittle, as ever, taking us through a whirlwind of charts throughout the Bloomberg. And David Kirkpatrick with Techonomy, his favorite word, he's sticking with us. Now, coming up, we take a look at Samsung's historic earnings report. How the company continues to thrive despite the array of crises knocking at its door. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio, why don't you? You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. We want to begin right away by taking you live back to Hamburg, where police have resorted to water cannons in an effort to contain protesters at the G20 summit. Nearly 200 police officers have now been injured in clashes with these thousands of protesters. World leaders gathered for the talks have condemned the violence. Again, these are live pictures, and we're tracking the situation there. We'll keep you posted if there are any further developments. And meantime, Presidents Trump and Putin had their first confirmed meeting today in Hamburg. During the two hour plus affair in Germany, Trump confronted Putin about Russia's meddling in the election campaign, which Putin denied. Russia's economy minister says Putin also complained about economic sanctions. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who attended the meeting, said both leaders discussed how best to move forward. They had a very robust and lengthy exchange on the subject. Uh, the president pressed President Putin on more than one occasion regarding Russian involvement. Uh, president Putin denied such involvement uh, as I think he has in the past. Uh, the two leaders agreed though that this is a substantial uh, hindrance. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was also at the meeting. Secretary Tillerson said the Russians asked for, quote, proof and evidence of Moscow's involvement in the 2016 election. And the U.S. and Russia also announced a ceasefire for southwest Syria in an increased effort to stop the civil war. U.S. officials say the agreement would take effect Sunday at noon, Damascus time. G20 host Angela Merkel arrived at a concert hall in Hamburg for a show and dinner with other world leaders. During the first working session of the summit, the German chancellor said the countries must work together to help solve the world's problems. We all know the big global challenges and we know that time is short and therefore often solutions can only be found if we are ready to compromise when we approach each other but also and let me make this clear without giving up too much because there are differences as well. British Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson has traveled to the Middle East in a bid to end the political crisis with Qatar. His first stop, Saudi Arabia, one of four Gulf nations to cut diplomatic ties. Johnson is trying to get them to go along with a Kuwaiti-led effort to end the tensions. And the European Union's, ba Union's bailout authority has approved a $9.7 billion aid package for Greece. The majority of the funds will be dispersed on July 10th. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in for Emily Chang. Now let's turn back for a moment to our lead story. U.S. jobs data. Now retail hiring increased by 8,100 in June. Interesting, a recovery from just three months ago when the sector shed 30,000 positions in March. It's also notable since the industry has been hard hit by the so-called Amazon effect. The shift of retail sales from brick and mortar stores to less labor intensive online sales causing, of course, that headcount to suffer. Meanwhile, Samsung has had it tough of late, from its exploding smartphones to its heir apparent on trial for corruption. But the company made positive strides on Friday, reporting its best quarterly profit ever, boosted by the global demand for semiconductors. And of course, it's a popularity for the South Korean company's new Galaxy S8 smartphone also in evidence. Samsung's revenue beat estimates as well. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg Technology reporter Ian King, who's just returned from a reporting trip in Seoul and attended one of JY Lee's trials, no less. So with us from New York, my guest co-host for the hour is Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. Ian, you've got great insight for us. First of all, though, let's go with the silver lining around a few clouds for Samsung. The numbers, in particular your area of expertise, chips, they really are flying. Yep, that's right. I mean, as you know, I don't care about phones at all. It's only what's in them. It's only the, <laughs> the memory chips that matter. And, and that's really what's going on here. That's really the, the heart of Samsung as it became a, a modern, successful company. And it's a success that has continued to this day. It's been brutal competing against Samsung in the memory chip industry. Basically, everybody has given up apart from a couple of others, Micron and, and SK Hynix. And that has had a commensurate effect upon the balance of supply and demand. Pricing is great. Those chips are going into all manner of new things as well these days, which is helping on the demand side. Prices are fantastic, and uh, Samsung is definitely making a lot of money out of that market. Price is fantastic for the chip side of the business. They're also in an area that I'm not sure you're that much keen on either, but organic LED screens. Is this an area that the price is fantastic? Can it remain fantastic? Yeah, no, I mean, it, I, I do care about it because it's basically semiconductor technology as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, if, if you want to make a, a phone with an OLED screen which gives you thinner, better color, anything like that, you have to go to Samsung right now. They're the ones that put the factories in place. They're the ones that develop the technology at, a, at an extremely high scale. So the rumor is, as, as you know, Carolyn, that even Apple is going to have to come cap in hand to uh, Samsung later this year and say, give us as many screens as you can, please. And of course, David, this is what's so interesting is Samsung really going for it in terms of the bottom line and at the S8 seemingly doing pretty well, all ahead of the all important 10th anniversary iPhone. Yeah, unlike Ian, I have a slightly broader range of appreciation of tech. Uh, and this, <laughs> you, you got to say, Samsung has revived as a impressive phone maker. They're really head to head with Apple yet again. And uh, it is interesting to think about this most diversified company. I mean, there's probably no company we could think of does more things than Samsung. But, you know, they subsidized semiconductors and chips and memory when it was hurting. And now the prices are practically double what they were, I think, a year ago. Uh, you know, that's impressive. Uh, it is amazing that con compared with all the problems they've had that they're showing this historic profit uh, of, of today. It's, it's, it's a very yeah. impressive company, but they've taken advantage of some possibly unfair advantages they have in Korea. Interesting. Let's focus in on that now and some of the problems, the clouds amid all this silver lining. Ian, you've come back from South Korea. You went to court. Remind us why, why the heir apparent J.Y. Lee is there. It's all to do with corruption, isn't it? Now he's basically accused of uh, trying to bribe the president of the country who's actually on trial in a nearby courtroom and the sole courthouse there um, in order to get influence from the Blue House, the, the Korean presidential office, to help consolidate his control over the Samsung group. Obviously Samsung denies that, but um, that's why he's on trial. And where are we in terms of the stage of the trial? Because the clock's ticking. Yeah, I mean, if, if what I saw and what my colleagues told me that they've seen is anything to go by, it's not going very well for the prosecution. They haven't really found the smoking gun. They haven't really found somebody to, willing to turn on him. Everything so far has been pretty, pretty <coughs> circumstantial at best, according to what we've been told from experts as well. 
Um, so really the, the prosecutors are kind of running out of time in terms of the amount of witnesses that they can prove and while I was there the judge was getting pretty irritated with them just asking the same question over and over again and getting the same no answer which was no we have no evidence no I never saw anybody no I wasn't influenced by him no it never happened I mean that's really been the pattern so far interestingly of course they need to be wrapped up by August otherwise he walks free and David just I got a sense of your frustration you feel that potentially they do need to be looked at in this respect and held to account well I think we would not in the United States allow any of these chayball to be to behave the way they do I don't believe and of these giant conglomerate kind of sprawling interlinked companies uh, that dominate the Korean economy Samsung is the biggest and Ian can correct me but I believe Samsung alone represents something like 20 percent of all of Korea's exports so I mean is that right Ian 20 percent of GDP GDP that's even worse my god can you believe that I mean I don't think we would let a company have that kind of dominance in our economy and you got to believe that would require extraordinary scrutiny in any country and whether they've gotten that kind of scrutiny at least until now I doubt well the, the, I mean the flip side of that if I may is that they've been an enormously successful employer of South Korean people and they've brought in mainly money from overseas so the government and they themselves have argued we're making Korea richer we're making Korea a better economy and this is the engine of growth that we need so the two sides of the continues, argument yeah and it continues to innovate we'll see how the S8 continues to perform as we edge ever closer to the Apple new phone coming on sale as well. Bloomberg Technology reporter Ian King, fascinating insights from South Korea. Meanwhile, David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy, and my guest host for the hour, sticking with me. Now, Bloomberg is reporting that U.S. chipmaker Rambus is said to be working with an advisor on a possible sale, sending the shares today up as high as 15% at one point. Now, this is all according to people familiar with the matter. The company, which owns some 2,500 patents, has battled several other big chip makers in court. In 2015, Rambus began restructuring and started selling its own branded chips. Now coming up, the latest in the ongoing saga between Uber and Alphabet's driverless car unit, well it's hit a fever pitch. Why Alphabet's Larry Page will be heading to the courtroom, that's next. This is Bloomberg. Now the battle between Waymo and Uber just took an unexpected turn. Alphabet's self-driving car division dropped three of four patent infringement claims in its lawsuit against Uber over its autonomous vehicle program. It's the latest move in the ongoing fight over driverless technology. And Bloomberg also learned that Alphabet's CEO, that's Larry Page, has been ordered to submit to questioning by Uber lawyers. Joining us now from San Francisco is Bloomberg technology reporter Eric Newcomer, who has been reporting on this story and many when it comes to Uber. And still with me, my guest, co-host, Techonomy CEO, David Kirkpatrick. First First of all, Eric, why drop the three out of four parts of the patent infringement? The, the judge in the case had really been urging Alphabet to pull away from the patent cases. Um, this has really been a trade secrets lawsuit from the get-go, but there have been these four patent cases, and uh, Alphabet's basically walking away from three of them and only has one left. Uh, they're basically saying that uh, Uber isn't using that technology anymore. They're, they've switched to something else uh, called Fuji, and so the remaining uh, suit is around uh, the patents and the LiDAR that Uber is still using, not the one that Alphabet says that they've agreed not to use. And meanwhile, Uber's saying we want Larry Page to be questioned. I mean, what's the rationale behind that? Well, Larry had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Anthony Lewandowski, who's uh, the software engineer from Auto, who's at the heart of this case, who is pleading the fit. So if they want to hear what happened in that case, they have to talk to Larry Page. I think there's also going to be this suggestion that, you know, Larry Page has a lot of side projects. He's got these flying cars that sort of compete with Alphabet. So it's not that crazy that Anthony Lewandowski was, you know, working on things very similar to what Alphabet was doing, and that was sort of the culture at Google. So I think they're definitely going to want to ask Larry Page some questions about, you know, what was sort of standard practice and whether Anthony was really doing anything that odd here. I'm pleading the fifth, meaning Anthony Lewandowski doesn't have to be giving any evidence, it would seem. Right. David, just talk us through what 
this all means in terms of Uber's current state of affairs, which Eric covers so well. And it, this actually hits to the heart of their own business model and their forward thinking for where the company goes. And is this something that you're keeping a very close eye on? Well, certainly it's just one more, you know, I, I would not say nail in the coffin because certainly Uber continues to thrive. But this is a company that has, it's sort of like, you know, a, a magic trick where there's a lot of nails going into something. Um, uh, you know, I don't think Uber... I, I hardly can think of a tech company that has more blots on its reputation than this one. It would be great for them if they get out of this case with, you know, unscathed. And Eric's reporting has been terrific in helping me understand what's going on. Uh, certainly, you have to look at this on, with so many other things happening with Uber currently, you know, no CEO, um, currently, you know, sort of being led by uh, Ariana Huffington? Is that who is sort of in charge there? We don't even really know. You know, tons of people have left. Uh, you know, the, the scandal of sexual harassment, all kinds of things still simmering. Uh, and yet, yeah. uh, everybody still uses it. Uh, and it's growing around the world. So, interesting Eric, company. back to this back to this particular court case. And it seems as though, actually, Uber's sort of come out fighting with the with respect to the fact that three out of four patent infringement cases have been dropped. Do they have a leg to stand on? Right. I mean, they're, they're definitely happy to see that. I mean, and, you know, like I said, the judge sort of saying that Alphabet should pull back on them was a pretty strong sign. I think, you know, it's really going to come down mostly to these trade secrets uh, cases. And even that, Alphabet has to pull down from more than 100 to less than mm -hmm. 10. I mean, and that's mostly about what a jury can reasonably focus on. So they're going to focus on, you know, a couple, you know, fewer than 10 claims and really sort of dig deep on them. And I, I think there's there are still questions about what Alphabet's been able to turn up. You know, they haven't really tied Uber to having these files or to asking yeah. uh, Lewandowski to get these files. So there's a lot that the judge has been saying, you know, I'm still not convinced here. You still need to prove a lot yeah. here. The saga continues. You'll keep reporting. Bloomberg's Eric Newcomer, thank you so much. And our guest host, Techonomy's David Kirkpatrick, sticking with us. Now coming up, Apple's war of words with imagination technology is showing no signs of slowing down Why the iPhone maker is crying foul on the UK chip designer's version of events. This is Bloomberg. Now, the war of words between Apple and its soon-to-be former supplier, Imagination Technologies, is heating up. Shares of UK-based Imagination Technology fell in Friday trading. This after Apple told Bloomberg it had given its supplier almost two years' warning that it was winding down the relationship. Now, the two have been sparring publicly since April when Imagination Technologies finally announced to the market its IP won't be used in new Apple products, sending its shares plummeting. Now, earlier I spoke with Bloomberg Technology reporter Adam Santariano, who who's reported on this story and asked, well, him exactly the supplier knew when they knew its partnership with Apple was on the chopping block. Imagination Technologies is not a company that most people hear about or really care about necessarily, but it's an interesting story because their business is so, they're an example of a company that's so closely linked to Apple. Their whole business is essentially cultivated around bowing to Apple and doing what they want to do. But in April, they disclosed that they were losing this contract and their stock just completely plummeted. It went down more than 60%. And they said that they, they came out and said a lot of things about they, how they doubted that Apple could do this without violating their intellectual property. And there was a bit of uh, making it seem like that this had come out of nowhere. To investors, obviously, as you saw by the stock drop, they, uh, it was clear that they were surprised by the move. But now you've spoken to Apple, and it seems as though they're saying they're refuting the timeline right. that Imagination Technology has put to the market. So, yeah, so it gets interesting because Apple has come out and said that basically saying this timeline that uh, Imagination has given to investors was not really accurate, that Apple had told them as far back as February that they were going to be dropping them completely, but that even almost two years prior, going back to 2015, Apple had begun kind of winding down the relationship as it begun to develop the technology itself. Two years previous, they'd been sort of given a few warnings. Several months previous, they'd actually been informed that this is likely to happen. What on earth can they come to the market? 
can explain the holdup because this is in against market practice in many ways deemed illegal sometimes to be not letting investors know something that will significantly impact the share price. Yeah, and talking to an attorney who used to work for the, the UK regulator here, he says something that they'll definitely be looking into. There are nuances in which a company doesn't have to disclose. And what Imagination said is that they had a contract with Apple starting in 2014 in which there was non, essentially non-disclosure agreements in there saying mm -hmm. that like we can't, we're based on uh, this agreement with Apple, we can't talk about the sort of ups and downs and uh, of the negotiations and the talks, which are constantly ongoing. And so, what they said is, when they got the the final clearest word that this was there was no going back, that this was ending, that happened at the end of the March, and on the next business day, they say that's when they disclosed it. But it's clearly in dispute, and it's something that I'm sure some uh, regulators in London will be looking into. We've had statements from Apple, but what have Imagination Technology told you? Yeah, Imagination Technology said that they have, um, that they disclosed it in the proper manner, that they did it when they had clarity from Apple, and that's kind of a key word in the legalese of this thing is that when it was there is clarity uh, and so it depends on, on the interpretation of these things and so lawyers we involved as they tend to be with Apple lately as uh, uh, this Qualcomm another supplier Qualcomm is and the two of them are entangled in a mess too so Qu question for you to broaden this out that this isn't just something that's affected imagination technology in terms of its dependence on Apple. You just have to type in the supply chain function on Bloomberg and see how many companies are very dependent on Apple. Are there other suppliers that many are now questioning or been worrying about? Yeah, I mean, any company, it's, it was this Apple and the iPhone was this incredible success story and there was a lot of companies who got their components inside to do a very specific little thing but those businesses just like got caught on the rocket ship and went like this but of, but of course along with that their business just became more and more reliant on Apple and Apple is known to if, if they decide that a technology is something that's core to what they want to do that they're going to build it out themselves and chips is something that they've been doing more and more internally because you're able to perhaps get more power out of it while using less battery uh, or you can fine-tune it in a way where it's specific to a kind of function that you want to do whether that's something with Siri or the augmented reality stuff that they want to do and so as they try and do more of this on their own the suppliers who were once do making this little thing may no longer longer be making it and then the the business that that was predicated on can kind of collapse so that's the people who work there the investors as we're seeing with imagination and so it's this domino effect that a company of Apple's size can have that was Bloomberg Technology reporter Adam Satariano. And still with us is my guest co-host, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick from New York. I'm going to be bringing you now in the supply chain function. I ask you to lean into your television, screw up your eyes, because it's so important that I do want you to try and see. And this is Dialogue Semiconductor. This is another supplier to Apple. Check out its dependence on Apple. On the, this side of the screen, 75